Hey everyone, Pushing Up Roses here, and today I'm in the mood for something silly, memorable, and share centric so I decided to break down the postmodern Prometheus, a standalone episode from The X-Files. And when I say standalone, I mean it. Not only does it not follow the overarching plot of the show, it was shot differently, has all of these cheesy pop culture references, and I'd say you could even consider this more of a fantasy episode that just happened to use the characters. It may not even be canon to the show's mythology. This is not uncommon for the X-Files. In fact, most of the series consists of what show creator Chris Carter calls Monster of the Week episodes. The show ramps up its main storyline as the seasons go and they become fewer, but this particular episode really stands out among the others. The title references Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. The modern Prometheus is the book's subtitle, though it has since been dropped over the years. This episode takes a lot from the Frankenstein mythos. It was shot in black and white to reference the films, and the plot involves scientists doing unethical testing to create a monster who really isn't all that monstrous. Maybe man was the monster all along, and all that jazz, you know the story. A lot of people consider this a classic and one of the best standalone episodes in the entire series. I think it's a campy ride with some loose ends that drive me absolutely bonkers, but we'll get into that later. For now, let's get cheesy. Is it true Jerry Sprayer's coming to town? The episode begins with a shot of a comic book called The Great Mutato with an illustration of a two-headed monster skulking about. At least I think it's Mutato. Maybe it's Mutato, like Tomato. Yeah, you know, Mutato Mutato. We transition from the comic book into real life and right away I feel the B-movie, almost Pulp Fiction style the writers were going for, and the macabre waltz-like music that plays definitely helps with the atmosphere. An 18-year-old boy and his friend are off to go to a comic book convention despite his mom's reservations. His friend's name is Booger. Not important to the plot, but important to me personally that I point this out. You drive careful, Booger. He's the only son I've got. The woman, whose name is Shayna, is seen later that night enjoying some late night trash and doesn't seem to notice her house is being covered in tarp. The intruder starts frying up what looks to be a McDonald's sausage patty and fills the house with smoke. And then, Cher. Yes, Cher. You know. The one who was married to Sonny. Her cover of The Sun Ain't Gonna Shine Anymore starts playing. The great Mutato, and yes, it's Mutato, as in mutant, peeks through the door. At first I thought he was gonna murder her, but no person murders someone to the sweet sounds of Cher. This is clearly someone with a sensitive soul. Mulder and Scully receive a letter from Shayna. She explains that 18 years ago, she felt a presence in her house. She fell asleep, and three days later, she was pregnant and had a son named Izzy. She says she found out about Mulder from the Jerry Springer show, which is kind of hilarious to think about. You gotta wonder how the public would feel about Mulder and what kind of conspiracy theory shows and YouTube videos he'd be in if he were a real figure in the present. Shayna is writing because it happened again. She saw the monster, conked out for three days, and woke up pregnant. Mulder is intrigued enough to check it out. Mmm, perk soda, my favorite. Scully asks Shayna about her son. Mm-hmm, easy. That's him there. Oh, cute, but who's the one on the left? Scully asks if the intruder did anything physical to her, and Shayna seems quite sure that there was no physical union, she just woke up pregnant. Furthermore, she had her tubes tied. You can't plant a seed in a barren field. Well, that's one way to put it. So it's unlikely she was physically assaulted, but we're still talking about an unconsented pregnancy. Shayna doesn't seem very upset about it and is more intent on finding the creature that did this. Scully finds a comic book in her son's room with the monster Shayna described on the cover. It's the Great Mutato, a character her son created. Speaking of, Izzy gets home just in time to meet the two agents. These are agents Mulder and Scully from the FBI. The Federal Bureau of Investigations? No, Izzy, the female body inspector. Yes, the Bureau of Investigation. Mulder and Scully start to believe it's all made up after seeing the comic, but Izzy insists the monster is real and tries to lure him into view with a peanut butter sandwich. Scully is not impressed and thinks they could have been brought there under false pretenses. I think what we're seeing here is, is an example of, of a culture for whom daytime talk shows and tabloid headlines have, have become a reality against which they measure their lives. Hmm, strangely prescient. Mulder wants to give Shane's story a chance. Is there anything that you don't believe in, Mulder? A consistently good haircut? Suddenly they hear moaning off in the distance. What's that sound? They do see Mutado, but he manages to escape quickly because they waited a fucking thousand miles away from the bait and couldn't get to him in time. Yep, 
It's bread. Everyone attempts to chase him, but they are intercepted by a man that tells them to get off his property. He insists that there are no monsters and suggests they go talk to a real monster, his son, scientist Dr. Polidori. What do you want me to do with these, Dr. Polidori? This is how the plague started. Dr. Polidori tells Mulder and Scully all about the genetic testing he's been doing on fruit flies in a very stylized, mad scientist-inspired scene. But which I, through my genius, can alter into a creation of my own. Behold. The extra wide fly. The fly has legs growing out of its mouth. Mulder asks why he would do this, and Polidori gives no other reason than... Because I can. He also says that it's impossible to do this type of testing on humans. When are you coming home again? Huh? When are you coming home again? What? When are you coming home again? God damn! Snap out of it! This is Dr. Polidori's wife who really wants children. The doctor does not. What do you want, a baby or a Nobel Prize? Well, let's see. Nobel Prize comes with money. Children come with diarrhea. Gonna have to think about it. She gets upset and dramatically throws herself on this oversized doily. Won't some mutant beast give me a child? The next day, Mulder makes a visit to the town's diner where he is very admired. Like, very admired. The town is pleased Mulder believes the legend of the Great Mutado and looks at him like he's a hero for trying to find it. An article was published in the paper and it's because Izzy recorded a conversation between him and Scully and sold it to the tabloids. He is, of course, in big trouble. What did I do? All I can say is I hope the answer to that question is nothing. Hello. Izzy admits to doing it because he wanted to get publicity for his Great Mutato comic book and shows them the tape recorder he used. But hey, what do you know? The recorder also has a share song on it. The one who was married to Sonny. It also captured Mutato singing to it and we cut to this amazing scene of him dancing and singing in the Polidori house. This is amazing, I love it. Scully gets back the medical reports on Shana, proving that she did have a tubal ligation, followed by two positive pregnancy tests. As they are driving, Mulder notices the Polidori house covered in fumigation tarp, and the two rush inside. I'm hesitant to play this part due to copyright reasons, but Cher's Gypsies, Tramps, and Thieves play during this scene, and it's a mood. It's both ridiculous and brilliant, and I do not want it to end. Unfortunately, the house is still filled with gas, and they pass out next to Polidori's wife. Presumably, for three days. So great, are they pregnant too? Dr. Polidori is not impressed. Mulder asks him if he knows something they don't, and then he drops this bomb. I'm accusing that your wife may have been impregnated. <laughs> oh wow, she perked right up. I don't care who the father is, I just want a child. Any mutant child will do. They find some strange residue on a frying pan in the house, as well as an empty, extra large jar of peanut butter. Meanwhile, Mutato is watching one of his favorite movies, Mask, starring Cher, of course. The movie is about a boy with a rare bone disorder, causing calcium to build up in his skull, which creates facial deformities. The boy is loved by his friends and family, and particularly by his mom, played by Cher. Polidori Sr. gives him a peanut butter sandwich and calls him son. While Polidori Sr. is looking through a photo album of him and Mutato, his son barges in, accusing his father of impregnating his wife. They get into a fight, and Dr. Polidori murders him. The town is looking for someone to blame for the attack on Polidori's wife, and Izzy gets briefly accused before his mom comes in to defend him. Scully finds Mulder and tells him the residue on the frying pan was an anesthetic used on herds of animals, and farmers have to register with the FDA to get it. Polidori Sr. was the only one registered in the town. Mutato finds Polidori Sr. and weeps with grief. He decides to bury him in the barn. Mulder and Scully find the anesthetic, the grave, and also run into a reporter who had seen Mutato burying his father. She is assumes Mutato must be the murderer. Dr. Polidori rounds up an angry mob and insists they must find and bring the monster to justice. Justice meaning burning things with torches. Again, this is lifted almost exactly from the 1931 Frankenstein film, and even though I know that, I could really only think of Beauty and the Beast. Freaking Gaston, you know? Kill the beast! Kill the beast! So these assholes storm the barn, which seems like a terrible idea considering they just brought torches into a place filled with hay. While the mob is distracted, Mulder and Scully search the cellar under the house and find... A share shrine! Dang, this monster is obsessed. Snap out of it! They discover Mutato hiding in the corner. Ah, uh, you found me. And me. Mulder tells Scully they have to get him out of there or the mob will kill him. Speaking of... Force on fire! Oh really? 
Really? Who could have seen that coming? I can't believe this shit. The reporter spots Mutado peeping out of the cellar and the entire mob goes down to attack him. Polidori claims that his father is the one who created the so-called monster, but Mutado begins to speak, surprising everyone. He tells them that it was Dr. Polidori who created him with horrible experiments. Polidori Sr. found out and rescued him, then raised him like a son, unbeknownst to Polidori Jr. He lived his life in the barn and desired friends or a companion, so his new father tried to learn science to try to recreate one for him. That being said, I have no idea how they managed to impregnate these women or whose sperm they used. It is implied that the father tried to create hybrids using farm animals. But who's the father? <laughs> Are they implying that she is pregnant with a pig baby? It's not explained, mind you, just implied. It's further implied by the photos of her son Izzy next to a pig, and all the references to pigs and barns throughout the entire episode. That pig's die there's his room. Mutato doesn't really answer, he's just like, heh, <laughs> the experiments didn't work. He pleads with Polidori to make him a mate. I don't know how to recreate you. You were a mistake. Mutato admits that what they did was wrong. He also explains that during the three days the women were being impregnated, he went through their records and books and became cultured. And for whatever reason, despite violating these women's bodies, they side with Mutato. He's no monster. He's a Cher fan. So instead, Polidori is arrested for the murder of his own father. Mulder laments, saying that it isn't fair that Mutato doesn't get a bride because, hell, even Frankenstein gets a chance to look for love. In a very meta moment, Mulder asks to speak to the writer of the great Mutato, who is Izzy, presumably so he can demand he change the ending. Now for the best part. The end scene shows Mulder and Scully taking Mutato to a Cher concert where she performs Walking in Memphis. When I was walking in Memphis. <laughs> God, what is happening? As the crowd cheers, Mulder and Scully share a dance. Gosh, how romantic. It ends by fading into the last page of the comic book and... Wait a minute. What happened to Mulder's eye? It shifted like an inch up. I'm pretty sure this is now John Travolta. Like, oh my God, Mr. Carter, my eye. I stared at this last screen for so long, consumed by the weirdness of Mulder's right eye, these zombie looking people in the crowd, and this phantom hand that seems to be attached to nothing. Okay, so let's think about this for a second, and I do mean literally a second because that's all the time you need to understand some of the implications in this episode. The way I've come to understand it is that in order to make a mate for Mutado, the farmer, who was not a man of science, tried his best at haphazardly experimenting with animals in order to create some kind of hybrid. Now where this fits into impregnating the women, I don't know. I don't know what happened in those three days. It doesn't seem like they were impregnated via intercourse. It seems more like it was some kind of weird in vitro thing that didn't pan out because Polidori Sr. didn't know what the fuck he was doing. And when Mutato is speaking at the end, I started to get squicked out because the camera would pan over all of these animals. Now, you cannot create a human embryo with animal cells. It's not possible. I don't even know if that's where the episode was going, but considering its focus on genetic testing, playing God, and this is the X-Files, I wouldn't put it past the writers. I just couldn't ignore all the creepy foreshadowing that involved the farm animals, particularly the pig. If I am wrong, then we're looking at rape apology, and the father could either be Mutado or Polidori Sr., but Shana's tubal ligation story leads me to believe the pregnancies happened in some way using some kind of fictional scientific process, or it could have happened paranormally. It could also just be a comparison between man and beast, but it seemed pretty direct to me. Either way, no matter who said cells were used to impregnate these women, they still had their bodies violated, yet they're happy and satisfied, so I don't know. Also, Mutato is now 25. Is he supposed to just wait for these babies they wanted to create to be of age so he can have a partner? We're obviously supposed to be more comfortable with the women's unconsented pregnancies because Mrs. Polidori, at the very least, wanted children, but Shayna had a tubal ligation after her son. That's the exact opposite of wanting children. So there was only a small attempt to make Mutato look more virtuous than he actually was. And that wasn't even the point. Polidori Sr. had no sympathy for the wife's desire for children. He didn't experiment on her to grant her some beautiful wish. And Shayna clearly didn't expect to get pregnant again. 
But in our trespasses, we gave you a loving son. She didn't ask for one Mutado! Snap out of it! The farmer just wanted to keep trying to recreate another mutant for Mutado to play with, and comes across just as cold as Polidori Sr. Why? Because I can. The story really focuses on these women and their mysterious pregnancies. That is what brings the X-Files agents to town in the first place, and that is the conundrum we need to figure out. But I'm not really sure if it works alongside the Frankenstein mythos. If I were to script doctor this, I think I would have gone full body snatcher, had characters experiment on the dead, dead animals, maybe live animals, though that would likely be too close to the material it was inspired from. As you can see, I'm both amused and conflicted with this idea. I understand why the episode was so well received. On a production level, it's really well done. It was shot with a wide angle camera lens, and because of that, the actors look and speak directly to the camera, giving it this simultaneously dramatic and cheesy feel. It pays decent homage to Frankenstein, specifically to the 1931 movie I mentioned earlier, and there are lines lifted directly from the book itself. Though sometimes the concept is really pushed onto the audience as though Carter himself didn't trust them. Good night, Dr. Frankenstein. Yes, if you haven't figured it out, this is a parody of Frankenstein, thanks for the reminder. It gets really heavy-handed, especially when Mulder goes on his spiels about mad scientists and playing God. The episode is already called the postmodern Prometheus, we don't need it called out so directly. Most people assume the end scene with the Cher concert is fanciful, but I'd argue that the entire episode is. It just doesn't really tie into any of the X-Files lore, and there are many hints to suggest it's purely fictional within the show. Specifically, I noticed everyone in the town Mulder and Scully were in had these extremely old cars. Not just a few people, but most of them. Even some of the backdrops are clearly fake, as though it was just a set provided for the storyline. It reads like a short film within an episode. And yet, it does seem to be set in present time, Jerry Springer being the giveaway, so it's just surreal and weird. Oh right, and I almost forgot to mention the biggest indicator for the episode being fantastical, and that is the fact that we open with the comic book transitioning into the story, then transitioning back at the very end, though it's a little confusing to think that we're being told the comic book when the comic book is in the episode. Overall, I liked it because it's so absurd. It's absurdity with good production quality. Now, I'm a Cher fan, so I ate up these references in the songs scattered throughout. Again, they pushed the point too hard by referencing the movie Mask, but I couldn't help but enjoy the hell out of this bizarre-ass plot. Cher loved that boy so much. That she did, Mutado that she did. It also has the best ending of any X-Files episode, but I can't really put behind some of those insinuations. If you can look past those, it's a fun time with a lot of pop culture references, good acting, and nice aesthetics. Or you can skip the whole thing and watch the ending, fist bumping the Cher's cover of Walking in Memphis. Yes, what a banger. I think I will bestow upon this the most questionable episode award. It's fun. It's bizarre. It's a little problematic. Yup. It's questionable. All right, good talk. If you have an off the rails episode of the X-Files you're just dying to see me talk about, please leave a suggestion in the comment section. I do take them into consideration. And until then, the truth is out there. Hey everyone, thanks for watching my video on the postmodern Prometheus. I hope you enjoyed it. I have more X-Files content on my channel that I'd love to show you, but first a quick shout out to my patrons who paid for this video to be made. Isn't it good to know your tips and donations are going to a good cause? Thank you so much for all your support and donations. It really means a lot to me. If you want to see more content from me, I have a few recommendations on the screen. On the left, I have another episode breakdown of The X-Files, and on the right, I have a wonderful little review on The X-Files live action FMV game. Definitely check those out for all of your Mulder and Scully shipping needs. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one.